Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. University of Wyoming dance faculty member Marcia Knight was so affected by the opening of the Ellis Island Immigration Museum that she began to consider the possibility of creating a production about the immigration experience. Her result? A multimedia dance theater effort after a year-long sabbatical and research of oral histories of the immigrants and refugees who passed through Ellis Island. Six songs from Ellis, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for Wyoming Chronicle is provided in part by the Dragicevich Foundation, supporting the work of the Jackson Hole Historical Society and Museum. Marcia Knight, Professor of Ballet, Composition, and Historical Dance here at the University of Wyoming. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you, Craig. Our viewers have seen just a snippet of six songs from Ellis, and that's where we would like to begin. Mm -hmm. Tell us, Marcia, your history with six songs from Ellis and why it has become a passionate project for you. Well, it's very interesting. I am a ballet professor. This is what I do. But in 1997, I um, had the opportunity to visit the Ellis Island Immigration Museum. And as part of their exhibition, they have uh, these audio snippets that you can listen to, very, very short, maybe a sentence or two, about the experience of, the, of those who came through Ellis Island. And so these are elderly people reflecting on their immigration experience when their, they were children. Their first person experience. Yes, their first person experience. I was very um, impressed with this and I thought maybe this has some creative potential. And so my husband and I returned to Ellis Island. I went to the third floor and I was able to uh, get acquainted with the collection of oral histories that are there learning there, that there are about 2,500 of them that are in the public domain. And this was very um, a breakthrough moment to me and that I could have use of these um, oral histories. Uh, I also learned of the fact that there was a very concerted effort in the 70s to start gathering the oral histories firsthand of people who had gone through Ellis Island. And um, I became acquainted well with a woman named Janet Levine, who was one of the oral historians. And thus started a process of about four trips to Ellis Island, uh, starting in 2007, to comb through these oral histories and to think about how possibly to utilize them in a dance theater piece. I ultimately- Was that, I'm, I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. was that hard to make that connection from these impactful oral histories to dance. Mm -hmm. Well, it is dance and it is theater, very uh, much a presence of theater in the work. I was very intrigued with the idea of utilizing the audio of the immigrants' uh, oral history, as well as using the transcription as perhaps actor text, blending that with movement. So it's very literal. It's the words of the, mm -hmm. the actual person themselves, actor uh, stepping in on occasion, but dance used as a, an abstraction, a more uh, fleshed out notion of perhaps what that person might be feeling, what they might be experiencing rather than the words, which are very, very powerful. But I do believe in the process, dance gives something that words maybe can't give. Our viewers are going to have an opportunity to see more of Six Songs from Ellis here in just a minute but you ended up taking a year-long sabbatical yes. to further your research. Right. So we produced the piece here in 2009. Uh, it was a large endeavor. I felt <clears throat> we had accomplished a great amount, but after that I was not quite sure what to do with the piece. And in, two, in 2016, 2017, my husband and I were able to take a sabbatical to New York and research on six songs from Ellis struck me that this was a good time to move forward with revisiting this piece and really reshaping the piece. What connection have you drawn between the experience of immigrants then and the experience of immigrants today? 
When we did the work in 2009, uh, the piece was adjudicated by the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, and we were able, uh, from that experience, to go to Reno, Nevada. And an, an educator, um, adjudicator, said in that adjudication session, these stories need to be heard, they need to be told, they need to move, move forward. He was very taken with the structure and the potential for this work. Um, I believe that the many, many voices that are represented, about hun a hundred oral histories are represented in this piece, that speak to commonalities. Why do people go to such extraordinary lengths to change their position, to advance opportunity? What is the motivation then? And inferring from that, what is the motivation now for people to improve their circumstance and their situation? The first song in six songs of Ellis is The Walk Away. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And it has to do <clears throat> with, again, what compels people to leave? Why the change of circumstance? And these are people who uh, maybe were in Ireland or people in, uh, in, in Italy who had no economic advantage. They had no hope, but they had the belief that they could get to the United States. But they chose to make that voyage to leave, fa to leave family and to leave home. It's a very brave endeavor, and this is what people, I believe, um, experience now. Many of the same themes, many of the same motivations. One day in 1920, in July, a man from Boston, Massachusetts came to visit us in Aleppo, Syria. And then the man came to my father and said, Mr. Farishian, he says, I have a ticket to go to America. Do you want to go with me? And my father said, I'm penniless. I don't have any money. How can I go to America? He says, I have the ticket. You come to America, and if you like America, you stay there. And I'll send the money for your whole family to come here. God sent an angel to Aleppo, Syria. Isn't that a miracle? I don't know how much you believe in God, but believe in God. If God wants things to happen, <laughs> it will happen. Well, you see, my mother had a brother in America, so I wrote him a letter. I said, my dream, I long to get out from here. If you give me a chance to come to America, <laughs> And my uncle, well, he was a gambler, a heavy gambler. But the night he got my letter, he played. And the man he was playing, well, he was a ticket agent. He said, we'll play one ticket for my niece. And he won. And he said, one more for the expenses. And he won. second song continues, The Song of Flight. Mm -hmm. The Song of Flight. And the Song of Flight um, separates for me those who chose to walk away from their circumstance, uh, so immigrants coming to the United States, as opposed to refugees who were forced to flee their situation. In my um, reading at Ellis, there is just this wealth of oral histories of those who survived the Holocaust and those also who survived the Armenian Genocide of 1915. They were stories that moved me tremendously. So in the first iteration, I had uh, 
used those stories and kind of interspersed them along with immigrant stories, whereas in the second song, I chose to have the second song be the song of flight, of leaving um, as one had to leave because there was no home to return to, um, and specifically the Holocaust and the Armenian Genocide. I remember the taste of the water, springs that would come from the ground. Figs, apricots, and the grapes. I can almost remember the taste of each. I was about eight, nine years old at the time. Seven years old. When the Turks kicked us out of our country, Armenia, and they dumped us in the Syrian desert. Why did they massacre? That I don't know. Why did the Germans massacre the Jews? Because the Armenians were the power of money. This was the 1914 war, see? That's when the massacres start. I am one of the survivors. In front of our house, we had a small garden, and there was what we used to call a bee house. The whole building was beehives. So every once in a while, Turk used to attack us. They used to do that before the massacre. So when the Turks were coming, they burned the bees, house with bees in it. So my grandfather said, what do you want from the bees? They don't do anything to you. Why do you want to burn them? They shot him where he was. And in 1915, uh, Armenian uh, deportations started. Uh, Turkey was allied with Germany. The Allies thought that they were fighting a noble war. They were going to make democracies, the world safe for democracy, and, uh, and give back minorities their lands and their countries and their freedoms. Big talk, big ideals, which uh, irritated the Turks. They thought, well, if there are no Armenians, if Armenia is without Armenians, to whom are you going to give a country to? And they proceeded into a diabolical plan of <coughs> creating an Armenia without Armenians. And, uh, of course, they did not have the sophisticated gas chambers then. How would they accomplish this, Armenia without Armenians? So they would displace every Armenian and uh, uh, drive them into the desert, the Syrian desert. It was called a place Del Zor. The idea was to get every, every Armenian there. By the time they got there, they would uh, either die of hunger or, or exposure or uh, pestilence. I think that the idea was to take the male population first and kill them along the way. And they'd shoot them, you know, brrr, with guns. You'd see them falling down. They took us someplace where even the donkey can't walk. Young, old, blind, lame. Water Underfoot, which Our has speaker. to do with what was the experience like to board the ship? What did they bring with them? What are the stories having to do with preparation to, to board the ship? What did they tote? What did they leave behind? Um, things that happened on the, um, the journey itself. Uh, a wonderful story of a, of a Jewish woman attempting to celebrate um, the Sabbath and sailors blowing out uh, the Sabbath candles, um, sneaking things on board, this kind of thing. This is very charming and very amazing. Um, people experiencing having no food and thinking that the food was, was not something that they consume. Another person saying this was the best food they had ever had in their lives. Um, wonderment at the surroundings, disgust at the surroundings, all the things that those people in third class really experienced. When we first saw my father, we kissed in that, and then he gave us a banana. We didn't have those in Turkey. And my brother said, I'm not eating that. So I said, that's all right. 
Well, if the Americans are eating it, I'm going to eat it. So I bit into it. And I didn't really know how to eat the banana, so I'm chewing on it and I'm choking, and I didn't know what to do, and I didn't want to give him the satisfaction that I was going to throw it out, <laughs> right? Oh, nearly everyone was sick. When we could get up, that we could eat, we went to the dining area. Oh, and the crew, they were real lively. Of course, they weren't sick like we were. They were already used to that. They used to say, cockroach soup roast is served. <laughs> <laughs> and the food was so bad that my father and I would sneak up to an upper class that were barricaded. You weren't allowed to go, but we snuck up there and we found garbage cans on the deck in the corner. And the garbage of the first class passengers were placed there, and the sailors used to throw pieces out for the gulls. And we would steal uh, from the garbage can pieces of meat, even though we were kosher, but we were so hungry that we took them. And I tell my grandchildren, I ate out of a garbage can. Song four. Song four. Landing on two feet. Landing on two feet. A lot of power in those mm -hmm. words. Yeah, right. And again, the incredible impressions that people had on seeing the, the harbor of New York, on seeing the Manhattan skyline for the first time, um, of the processing experience at Ellis Island, which all third class passengers had to go through. You have to remember that third class um, people were processed at Ellis Island, not those of first class or second class. They had a tidy little processing uh, procedure on the boat itself in the New York Harbor and off they went directly on their way. But third class went to Ellis Island. It was a very frightening experience for most and they in underwent um, inspections having to do with medical uh, wellness, mental wellness, and being approached. They were, these were very reticent people and this was a very, very difficult process for them to go through. Most people went through Ellis. It was uh, an unpleasant day, probably, but they were in and out in a short amount of time. But about 20% of people were detained for further inspection, and 2% approximately were deported and sent back. This is what happened. Here I was, I was released, and the nurse took me back to the huge waiting room, and I ran to the far side of the, of the, of the area. No grandmother. There was a grandmother, but it wasn't mine. All of a sudden, somebody took me by my arm and whirled me around. She said, where in the world did you come from? It was the matron, the overseer. And I explained, I said, I have just been released from the hospital, and I thought my grandparents were here waiting for me. Oh, your grandparents? I'm sorry, child, but they have been released many weeks ago. So I, this was like colliding with an iceberg. You see, in their, in their excitement, my grandparents had taken my winter clothes and my coat, my, my hat, everything. So I just had my, my dress, and it was bitter cold. This was December. She said, well, don't, don't cry, don't cry, we'll, we'll see that everything will be all right. And she took me down the hall, she had a huge bunch of keys around her waist. She took one of those keys, opened the door, there we were in another here, large room, and it had a huge pile of clothing uh, brought there by the Salvation Army and the Goodwill Industry and the Red Cross. She said, now, you try on a coat. She spoke a uh, very, very slight uh, German. And she said, yep, yeah, try on, try on. And I tried on, cold after cold after cold. Either it was for the romper set or much too big for me. Well, she kept looking at her watch. 
mach schnell, mach schnell. That means, hurry up, I don't have much time. And she pulled out a long green wool coat and it reached down to my heels, sleeve covered my hands completely. And I looked in there, they had an oval mirror and I almost started to cry when I saw myself. And she said, I'm sorry, I, I, we don't have your size, and, but it's warm, that's the main thing. You won't freeze to death. So by and by, there were more people coming in and somebody came in and hung a, a tag around my neck with all pertinent in information. Then the official said, follow me, you will be brought to Manhattan. I took a last look at the Statue of Liberty and I was wondering, would I ever meet again? <laughs> and uh, then I looked at Ellis Island and I thought, oh, how many tears I had to shed there. I really cried, cried me a river. On to song five, A Change of Current. Right. Now in America. Mm -hmm. Obstacles. Initially, I had thought about calling this song um, walls or uh, obstacles or what are things that barriers that got in the way of those who came to Ellis Island? What are the stories of those who, who tried to enter the United States and couldn't? Um, stories of families who maybe had a family member who was deported. These are a little harder to find because the oral history collection is of those people who got in to Ellis Island mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so it generally was an aunt or it was seeing people who were um, going to be sent back. Um, those who were considered uh, feeble or not mentally well or who didn't have the resources to be here. Um, so the stories of um, obstacles and again um, this rings very very true to today. A hundred years ago we look to our history, we see what happened with people and their stories of barriers and their stories of um, not having access to the things that we have access to. And one of the questions was, how many feet does a horse have? I think if I live to be 100, I will never forget that. And my aunt's answer was, she didn't know. Was he fooling her? Was he trying to trick her? Or was it a serious question? So she didn't answer. I think by then she was totally confused and maybe did not really know how many feet it was. That. I don't know. But that was the question that seemed to stop her. And they told us she was slated for deportation because they didn't know how badly, but she was mentally retarded. So my father talked to people and hired an investigator to find out what had happened in this investigation period. And it seemed as though she didn't know how many feet a horse had. She eventually was sent back. So unfortunately for my aunt, according to the laws, did not belong as a legal immigrant because she was obviously mentally retarded. And the sixth song, At the Lady's Feet, right. At the Statue of Liberty's Feet. Right. Just incredible stories. And you have to realize mm. that the oral histories at Ellis Island are told by people in their later years of life, reflecting back on their immigrant experience between maybe entering at the age of four or eight or 12 or 22. They're young people reflecting on what it was like to come to the United States. So their impression of seeing the Statue of Liberty, how they related to that, did they even have any idea of what the Statue of Liberty represented? There are wonderful stories about this, funny stories of saying, I, I had no idea what that fuzzy figure was <laughs> in, the, in the distance or I, I thought it was Columbus, for instance. I mean, they, they didn't necessarily understand what the statue was, but many people did. And there are incredibly moving uh, accounts of people speaking of uh, weeping and being joyful and um, celebrating with people that they didn't even know. And there are wonderful images to document this. So it has to do with at the lady's feet, um, 
landing in America, what that impression was like of seeing the statue. And uh, further beyond that, the very moving accounts of these people later in life reflecting on this experience as young people, but then talking about their contributions to the United States. They are citizens. They have been citizens of the United States their entire adult lives. What did they contribute? What did they give to our country? Marcia, you have many students, of course, in the theater and dance mm -hmm. department, and many students who are, come from Wyoming high schools, Wyoming students. How do they reflect <clears throat> when presented with a fairly deep context of six songs from, Al uh, six songs from Alice? Well, ultimately, and absolutely, theater is about education, it's about learning, and we do that in many, many different ways. But this piece is unique. It's really amazing because if an actor is portraying John Babayan coming from Syria, we have an oral history that the, the student can listen to and understand first on, on first hearing of what this person sounded like, what was the timbre of their voice, what was their occupation in life. So it's this immersion in experience of people and we're very, very, very um, clear to stay with and respect the expressions of people um, as they were um, presented in the oral histories. I uh, try to think what I would have lost if uh, the United States of America saw in their wisdom not to let us come in. Uh, I'm sure we would have all perished or been bars of soap. And on the other side, what would the United States of America have lost if there wasn't a guy like Lawrence Meinwald to have come to America. What did he do here? What did he accomplish here? I was thinking, I've been in business almost 55 years. I have owned approximately 200 pieces of real estate. I would say I have employed in my lifetime thousands of people. I tried to put a statistic together as to what I contributed, I would say, 50 million bucks. If you want to reduce it to dollars and cents, I spent and contributed. Well, it's a powerful piece, and our viewers have seen a little bit of it, but your passion about it is evident and clear. Congratulations on the work. Thank you, Craig. Marcia Knight, thank you for joining us on Wyoming Chronicle.